We want to welcome our viewers at home to today's Bible study. And we are going to adopt the Church of Nigeria Anglican Communion Bible study outline. And we are going to study study 29 and get your Bibles ready and your writing material. With me in the class is Brother Lekon Shurunke to my immediate right. You're welcome. And Mrs. Rose Onokoya, You're far welcome. right. You're welcome. And to my immediate left, Brother Michael Ogundipe. Good day. And my humble self, the Reverend Kanoni Ogumbo Wale. Shall we pray? Mrs. Onokoya, pray for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to share at your table. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher today and grant us understanding of your word. And Father, we pray that we will not just be hearers of your word, but doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, just to go back to the about three previous studies uh, that we have, in, we have been having, we have been talking about the omni, the omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence of Jesus Christ. And today, we'll be talking about his conception, the conception of Jesus Christ. How and why? And these are the things we are going to discuss. Uh, the aim of today's study is to discover some prophecies concerning Christ's unique conception that is different from natural conception. Number two, to learn from the chastities of the Virgin Mary, pureness of the Virgin Mary. Number three, to teach the importance of chastities or the pureness to the Christian family. And I want somebody to read from Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Son of David, do not be afraid to take, your Mary, to take you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being arose from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 35. Luke 1, 26 to 25. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when he saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greetings this was. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? since I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, 
the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. A virgin is someone who has never engaged in sexual intercourse. The conception of Jesus Christ describes how the Savior was conceived in the womb of the young Virgin Mary through the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit and without Mary having sexual intercourse with any man. God chose this mystery, which is beyond human understanding, to bring his son into the world. Now, when you look at this instruction, so people, some doubt that say, well, they call Mary the wife of Joseph. Now, according to Jewish custom, when somebody has been retreated, they say, where is your wife? That does not mean that they have been having sexual intercourse. If you look at it, say, your husband, wife, husband. That, that is according to the Jewish custom. They will not have anything. That is what we should look at it critically. That, so because some people say, well, okay, they said it's the wife, but it's the husband. What's the meaning of husband and wife? So that we will know, we will not confuse ourselves. Let me say that now that the conception of Jesus Christ, the uniqueness of the conception, what is the difference? And then these are the things that we want to look at. Now, question number one What are some biblical evidence, evidences of the virgin conception of Jesus Christ? That how? What, is it true that Mary was a virgin? What are the Bible references? That is, that is what we are going to answer in question number one. Question one, what they want us to say in that area, if we should look at um, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, it says this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. That's a, a, a Bible verse to, to point to us. Also, Luke chapter 1, verse 34 and 35. When Mary asked the angel, how will this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. It's something that had been prophesied that it would take place in that manner. And if we should look at it, even Mary, it looked as if God had prepared her mind. When the angel told her, she did not bother too much to the extent that she would fail. The, only, the angel told her this is what will happen. And in the same vein, the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream, such that he himself did not put the woman to shame. That is in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 1, which says, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And if you, if you should look at a Bible reference we have in that question, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it's it's prophesied there, therefore that the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. What else do we want to hear? The prophecy had been there, and when the event now came to place, God prepared the hearts of those that were to be used to bring forth the Holy Child. And that was a grace we all have uh, as human beings that for us to have our salvation because we know it was through the coming of Jesus Christ to the world that the world had salvation. He came to die for our sins. Well, what we just need to do is to have that faith and the belief in his name. Okay. Praise the Lord. Yes. Okay. John chapter 1 verse 13. We were born not of blood, not of will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That is talking about his conception, that he will be born not of the will of the man, 
without having carnal kind of knowledge of, maybe having carnal kind of knowledge of a man, but of the will of God, just to buttress his conception. And as my brother has said, it came to my mind that, okay, not the will of man. It is not that Mary determined that I'm going to born Jesus Christ. He, she, she, wasn't, she wasn't even thinking that he's going to born Jesus Christ. It was not the will of, he, or neither, the, the, neither Mary nor that of Joseph. But it was God that just decided, okay, I'm going to use this woman. And question number two, differentiate between natural human conception and the divine conception of Jesus Christ. When we go through the Bible references there, Genesis 4, 1, it says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and God came and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. The same Genesis 4, 17 says, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Also, there's 25. Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to his son and named him Seth. Okay. All these scripture verses we have seen talks about natural conception. A man and a woman coming together in sexual intercourse to conceive a child. But that of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a divine conception. The Bible verses that we have read already in Matthew 1, 18-19, Luke 1, 26 to 35, shows that Mary was found to be a child, even without knowing any man. She never had any uh, um, sexual relationship with Joseph, even though she was already betrothed to Joseph. So natural conception comes when a man and a woman comes together in sexual intercourse before they conceive. But divine conception is only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ is the only person till today that has been born through divine conception. Question number three. What does the Bible teach us about justice? That is pureness of men and virgins. What, what the Bible teaches us that, okay, they should be pure. The man should be poor, be the pure, and the woman should be pure. If you look at the records, as recorded in the Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 20 to 29, it's talking about the, the punishment for sexual immorality. When I talk about sexual immorality, it is between man and a woman. The record states clearly that uh, if a man have canon knowledge about with a, a married woman. The punishment is stated there. And we know that today, sexual immorality is the bane of the society. And we see it as, we take it with levity. We don't count it as an offense. And even among the young ones today, they see it as the order of the day. But the book of First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, is putting it straight to us that we should flee, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but who who commits sexual immorality sin against his own body. And we know that every human being, no matter how wicked that person is, loves his body. And he nurtures his body by eating well, by clothing it well. So if you want to hurt your body, the Bible is saying that uh, you should commit sexual immorality. And for us to learn for, from the purity and chastity of the uh, Mary, we need to flee from sexual immorality. And we go again to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter. It is God's will that you should be sanctified that you should avoid sexual immorality. We should avoid sexual immorality, abstain from it. Even, even our government also, also the Minister of Health say, uh, abstain from Secret. Se uh, sex. All this uh, arbitrary sex, we should abstain from it. It is entrenched in the word of God that we should flee from it. And when we do that, the blessings of God will come upon us. In a little way to buttress what he was trying to bring out, there, when we look at some advertorials, like the one on uh, when they make adverts for condom, after they must have done that, they will still say at the end that abstinence is still the best way. So if God is telling us that we should be sanctified, as we read in First Thessalonians, 
and such messages still go out on our media, then we as Christians should know that God abhors such filthiness. He wants us to be holy as He is holy. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But as I thought, I can see some of my people in my, uh, in my own thinking that well, they say, well, I thank God I'm not yet a man. I'm not yet a woman. I'm just a girl and I'm a boy. That what they are saying does not. But I want to put it the, the purity of male and female. Because you either be, a, you are a boy, you are a, you are, you are a male. If you are a girl, you are a female. So, so it is for all male and female. So that nobody has an excuse to say, well, they are not talking about me. I God is going to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Question number four. Say, so what lesson Christian draw from Mary's states at the visit of the angels? Now, what, what are we going to learn as a, as a Christian from Mary's states? That is her, her condition. How she, she was. If we should look at some of the verses, we have Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16. It says, Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. And I also want to add with 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 to 21. It says, In a large house, there are articles, not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, and some for ignoble. If any man cleanses himself from the matter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. If we should look at the state Mary was at the visit of the angel, it was because she was in a pure form. That was why God was able to choose her. If she had lost her virginity, the prophecy wouldn't have come to pass in her life. And if we should look at that second motive we now read, it's telling us that in a large house there are various articles, some of gold, of silver, of wood, and clay. If we should look at those comparisons, it ended by saying that some for noble purposes and some for ignoble purposes. Mary, in that situation, was a, uh, was a vessel used for noble purpose because she was found to be pure. For us as Christians today, God wants us to be pure. And if it's only when we are pure and holy that he can make use of us. It, and it's always a good thing. We all know that. It's always a good thing that uh, if God sees us as a vessel to be used, and we, we, it, ended up, it ends up using us. At some point, we also crave it that, God, I want you to use me. More so when we see some people being used of God to do exploits. We always try to end it that, God, I want you to use me, but is our life truly sanctified for that purpose? Is our life truly set apart for the use of God? If the way we, we say that Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, if they had committed fornication before their marriage, we know that that would not have been possible. And like my brother said, it's something that seems to have perverted our, our society these days. It's one issue that for children of God at times, even to hold themselves before marriage becomes a serious thing. However, we have it there in the Bible that we should be set apart. James 4, chapter, 8, James chapter 4 verse 8 says, Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. We just need to be purified for God. And that's the way God wants it, for us to be useful unto him. I think the lesson we should learn as Christians is that we should always live a holy and a righteous life. The Bible says that God abhors sin of any sort. And if truly, like he said, that we want to be vessels of honor, vessels fit for the master's use, that means that every point in time, we should make sure that we are in a state of grace, state of holiness, state of righteousness, fit to be used by God Almighty. Assuming when the angel came that uh, Mary was not in a state of holiness or righteousness, 
that prophecy wouldn't have come to pass. So as Christians, we should always be prepared because nobody knows when the angels are, is going to come. Well, in my, in my, as my brothers are talking and sisters, I was just wondering that it could not be Mary alone that happens to be a young, uh, a young girl. There will be a lot, a lot of young girls that will have messed themselves up. And I, I presume that the angel will just be passing and say, okay, this one no, this one no, this one no, this one no. Um, I said, we have a lot of girls. No, no, these people are not, they are not the right, something that, they are not the right vessel that I want to use. When we look at that second Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 to 21, that you discover that this state that somebody is will determine what they are going to be used for. I want to be just be practical. There are some girls that will only be useful when they want to do wrong thing. Maybe they, they want to know they are looking for girls that will dance naked in the in the club. Some they will offer themselves that okay, they are ready to dance naked. That is the, that that is that is they, they are the vessel that for for dishonor. And don't mind you, these these girls, these people that are calling this girl to come and dance naked in their club, they will not want their son to marry such a woman. They will not want they will not any of their son or any of their relatives to marry such a, such a girl. They say, no, 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 no. This one is only meant for the pop. This one is only meant for the club. This one is only meant for the aristo. So when they want their son to get married, they will be looking for a pure girl. Now, it, 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 it is now left for somebody to, to, to decide which one you are going to use. Even among, uh, among the boys or the males, some, they will only be you, they will only be good as a talk. So go and get some boys that can, that can destroy, some boys that can do a lot of things, that can smoke weed in, in, in the public. But when they need responsible boys, no, 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 no. It's, we are not talking about you. You just go and see. We know what we can, what we can be used for. So it is now left for us that, as a Christian, that are we going to be vessel of honor or to dishonor? Let me come down to the, to the priest, those of all priests. So, well, yeah, well, it's a priest. Well, we thank God. Let God judge him. But I'm not going to judge anybody. And some say, well, I know him. I, I trust him. He's my pastor. So, some of us, they may say that, okay, we are honorable. And people only give us honor because they want to give us honor. When well, we are dishonored. So, what I'm just saying, it, it, it encompasses everybody that in a, in a big house, there are vessels unto honor and there are vessels unto dishonor. Which one do we decide to choose as a pastor, or as a Christian, or as anybody? And God is going to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When they said that, draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinner, and provide your heart, you double-minded. You see, if you move very close to God, God is ready to move close to us. And if we separate ourselves from Him, we'll be going farther and farther away from Him. And the more we move away from, from God, we are moving very close to the devil, who is going to punish us and destroy us. And God is going to help give us the grace to move very close to him and watch our hands. It is not this physical hand that we are talking about. It is our deeds, what we do. That's what we are talking about. And God is going to help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Number five. What are the consequences of sexual immorality? What are the outcome? What are the things we lose? And what are the things that we gain if you have sexual immorality? The consequences of sexual immorality are Previous, both spiritually and otherwise. But we are concentrating on the spiritual aspect. But even in the physical, sexual immorality can lead to HIV, AIDS, and we all know the consequences of those things. And I want to state that despite the fact that we are living in a depraved society, sort of, we are people who overlook things like sexual immorality. It still is not right before God. And spiritually, it has a lot of consequences. I want us to just go through some of the um, scripture verses in the Bible. Ephesians 5, 
verse 5 says, For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So, as a moral, as a sexual immoral person, you have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. And the Bible says, if all our Christianity is just here on earth, we are of all men most miserable. Jude chapter 1 verse 7 says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, as set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Sexual immorality will, at the end, lead to eternal fire. And also, if you read uh, the one in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 22, Revelation 21, 8, it talks about hellfire. The end result of sexual immorality is hellfire. Is that where you want to end? After spending the number of years they're going to spend here on earth, is that what, how you want to end your life? In eternal fire, eternal damnation. I pray that God will give us the grace to overcome sexual immorality in all forms, in Jesus' name. Well, in addition, I, I, my, my sister has gone spiritual. Some people say, well, it's you that read Bible. If me, I don't read Bible. I'm, I just want to live a normal life. Even the free thinker, they, they, they don't, the free thinkers, they are not even at, they are not at peace with anybody. That's having, you cannot commit sexual immorality and be boast of it. It brings shame to the family. It brings shame to the person that committed the sin. So, the, the gospel is even grace. It's, it's grievous. And God is going to help us in Jesus' name. The supernatural conception of our Lord Jesus Christ is a proof of his pureness and holiness from human inheritance of Adam's sinful nature. He has to come through a woman who has had no sexual intercourse with any man to come to the world and fulfill the works of redemption. In, in summary, all men are seed of man. There's only Jesus Christ that is the seed of a woman because no intercourse. Food for thought. Christ, Mr. Robert, by a woman was without a man's seed. Shall we pray? Lord, we pray this day that the coming, the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will not be in vain in our lives. Amen. That this great, great problem of sexual immorality, that it will not destroy the church of God, neither will it destroy the world. Grant us the grace to be able to stay pure, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now we want to thank our viewers at home and the people that are able to make this Bible class that next time we we'll still be studying the words of God and in your leisure time let your Bible be your friend stay blessed and stay cool <laughs>